On today's show is a New York Times best-selling author and founder of multiple businesses, including some big names, Zico Coconut Water, which was sold to Coca-Cola, Marquee Jet, which was sold to Warren Buffett at Berkshire Hathaway. He's also, outside of all of that, an ultra-athlete running marathons, races over 100 miles, and apparently you rented a mountain for some people to summit, similar to Everest, so we'll dig into that story as well, talking about some new challenges. You're also married with four kids, so I don't know how you balance all of that. We'll delve into that as well, uh, as we are big on relationships, and obviously the both of us want to know how you make something like that work with all these other fascinating things you've been up to. And you are releasing your latest book here, Living with the Monks which is a follow-up to your bestseller, Living with a Seal. Quite a difference in terms of <laughs> stories going from the all-out physical to the all-out mental battle. Yes, first of all, I hope you guys join me on the mountain. You guys have an open invitation to climb the mountains with me at any time. So, you know, we'll come back to that later. Yeah, yeah. So well, John, our producer has been twisting my arm especially, so I'm yeah. gonna start twisting Johnny's arm to see if we can get him up to the summit. Okay, very cool, very cool. Well, thanks for having me, guys, that was a great intro. Yeah, and we were laughing about this a little bit before you got in. Also, a white rapper, which <laughs> <laughs> is a little unusual, especially back when you were getting into the game because yeah. That was pretty much a rarity as, as far as it is now compared to your Post Malones, your M&Ms, who kind of you know blew up that scene. So how do you end up rapping? <laughs> well, I grew up in a really interesting town. I grew up, I was talking about this the other day with somebody. It's funny that John is here because we went to high school together too. Yeah. But in the town we grew up in, if you took a four year, if you took four years from my senior year, and when four years up and four years down, we have multiple billionaires, we have two professional sports team owners, we have several kids that went to, ended up in jail, we had Madoff, the biz yeah. biggest Ponzi schemer of, course. of all time. We just had a wide range. There was something in the water in yeah. our town <laughs> that was a little bit different. And But we were close to the city, and I grew up in the, in the 80s when hip hop was emerging, close yeah. enough to to get you know kind of exposed to that early on because mm -hmm. of our proximity to New York and Long Island was a hotbed right. and I just gravitated towards that early I just saw it early at, at a basketball camp that I went to and I saw somebody break dancing and I was like man this is so cool and what is this all about and I just got into the music and it stuck with me and when I went to college and rap start radio started playing rap music etc uh, and record labels started signing artists, I was like, that's what I want to do. Right. Like, You guys write your resume and send it out to all those corporations. I'm going to go try to get a record deal. And that was my journey right out of college. You know, no B plan, no resume. I made a demo and, you know, I, that started my journey on trying to figure out how to get signed. Okay. Was there anyone particular uh, artist that was heavy hitting for you at that time? I mean, I was a big Run DMC fan, yeah. which is interesting because years later I ended up managing Run yeah. DMC. Um, I liked it all. I was a sponge. Yeah. And there wasn't a lot of ways to consume music back then. It was really just radio station, like local radio. And, you know, I guess as I got a little bit older in my high school years, MTV. Right. But that was really the only way to consume. You could buy records or, you know, cassettes or albums, but that was it. Not even CDs. Yeah. And, um, but I had no connections. You know, I had this, I recorded my demo tape by literally taking an instrumental, putting it in the CD player, and hitting record on my answering machine and leaving <laughs> raps while the music was playing. That was my demo. And my senior year of college, I took a Greyhound every Friday to New York City and I handed out that demo to every record label. I would sit in the lobby and just hand out the cassette to whoever with a note with my dorm room phone number on it. I got no responses. And um, I ended up moving back to New York City after college uh, and worked at a studio to professionalize this demo into a real demo. And one day when I was there, at the session before me, there was an artist named Dana Dane. I don't know if you guys remember Dana Dane. He was a Brooklyn-born hip-hop artist. I loved him. And his first album was a big hit, but no one heard his second album. He just finished recording his second album, the session before me, literally, like just mastered it and left the cassette or an extra cassette on the mix board. 
So I asked the engineer, I kind of took the cassette, asked, stole, whatever you want to call it, and to listen to it on the on a plane ride I was taking out to LA. And as I was flying out to LA, I read that the owner of Delicious Vinyl Records, the this hot independent label in LA mm-hmm. with Tone Loke, yeah. Loke, Wild Thing, and Young MC, you want to grab me for Bust to Move, that label, the owner's favorite artist was Dana Dane. So when I landed with this cassette in hand, I cold called the label and said that you know I had this cassette and maybe the owner wanted to hear it. And they got confused and thought that I was Dana. And the assistant came back on and said, Dana, if you can come at two o'clock, you know, Mike Ross, the owner, would love to meet with you. So I said, you know, Dana will be there at two o'clock. And I showed up and, I, and when he said, you know, where's Dana? I said, Dana's running late, <laughs> but can I play my cassette while we wait? And that's how I got a record deal. You know, it's, it's something that you had, there's several parts of the book where that ad- adaptation of finding a way to get it done. Um, when it was for getting people interested in Marquee Jet by buying all the, the the donuts that were in Starbucks and, and sitting there with that bag, knowing, well, I could get to pe- talk to people this way. The story with with Dana here of, of finding a way to get through, basically telling a bit of a fib to work your way through. Um, can you speak to anything about that? Like when did Was that something that you had seen your father maybe do or... Um, that led it itself to you taking that sort of role of finding a way to get it done, to find a way to get that meeting? Yeah, you know, I love challenges. Yeah. And it's more about the journey and the challenge and seeing can I get this than even yeah. anything that comes after. I just remember as a kid growing up in Roslyn, in Long Island, where I grew up, I remember I used to take the train to the U.S. Open. And I would always go without a ticket. And the challenge would be like, can I get into the U.S. Open without a ticket? And I remember like maybe in ninth or 10th grade, cracking the code with my friend Todd Nemet, probably remember Todd Nemet, John. (laughs) And we figured out a way to get in. As soon as we get in, he was celebrating, he was celebrating. I'm like, let's go back out and see if we can figure out another way to get in. (laughs) Nice. Like I had no interest in going, even watching the tennis. It was just about the challenge. And that carried over into business. It was like, the, the bigger the obstacle, like okay, I don't have an attorney. My dad owns a plumbing supply house. I don't know any, I have no connections. The more engaged I was to try to crack the code on how I could get signed. And you know, we have no airplanes and we want to start years later a private jet company. The more, just the the more I wanted to try to attack it. Yeah. And it wasn't even the business. It was just the journey of like, can we figure this out and make it work? That's where the passion was. Right. And what is, uh youngster in the 80s white rapper rap about growing up on Long Island with the father's a plumber. The only thing he knows about, girls and beer. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I wrote my album in college when I was in a fraternity. So it was like, I called it frat rock. You know, frat rap, frat rap. Um, Because all the themes were around what a college kid was going through. And, uh, And that was just honest to where I was in my life Right now, I, right at that point, I couldn't write about the streets or I'm just from Roslyn, Long Island. But I could easily feel comfortable writing about college girls and parties and Dave the Bookie and all these things that were going on in my life at that time. Right. And what was your rap handle? I'd rather not say. <laughs> <laughs> it was Jesse James, but don't Google it, man. <laughs> it's ugly. <laughs> so can we find your tracks on Spotify? Uh, I know they're on iTunes. I'm sure they're on Spotify. I haven't even I haven't even checked. I've tried to bury, you know. I, I believe in checking the box and move on. That box. <laughs> <Like that. laughs> yeah. Well, so rap was not your only musical outlet. You had a, a hit, a big hit that still played at Madison Square Garden. Yeah. What's the story behind you and your basketball tunes? Well, after my album came out, uh, I I didn't get picked up for a second album. So I moved back to New York City and I, I literally had two things on my resume. I had, prior to that I was a kiddie pool attendant and then I was a rapper. That was my basically my resume. And But I loved music and I loved sports and I really wanted to marry those two things. So I was like, let me write a theme song for the Knicks. You know, the Knicks, at the time, basketball was going through a change because the game is 48 minutes of actual action and but the fans are at, this, at the venue for three hours. So for 48 minutes, they're a fan, but for the rest of the other two hours, basically, they're an audience, and the arenas had to entertain them. And they started introducing dancers, and they started introducing videos and video screens. So 
with all this change in like the atmosphere, I'm like, let's do a song, a theme song, and get all the celebrities and the guard and like rally everybody, you know, like a rally song. So I I did this song on spec for the Knicks called Go New York Go. And um, they paid me $4,000 for the song. It cost me $4,800 to make the song, <laughs> which is not a great business model. Uh, but the Knicks got really hot. The song caught on. And the song ended up becoming the number one most requested song on New York radio. And every team that came into Madison Square Garden was like, why don't we have a theme song? Who, like, who's doing this? And I realized there was a tremendous amount of white space in that lane. Like, yeah. the, this new category of sports music was a category that I could own. I created it. Yeah. So I started writing theme songs for professional sports teams. And I believe a famous person was your intern at the yeah. origination of Alphabet City Sports Records. Yeah, I had uh, I was working with um, Jam Master J from Run DMC. We shared a desk, like not no one. You guys, people can't see, but not you know like a really good desk like we're at right now, like a yeah, regular right. office desk. And uh, one day he said that he had a, 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 a guy that he was going to sign who was a boxer and he needed a job. And he was going to sign him to Jam Master J Records, JMJ Records. And um, so this kid came in. He was 18, you know, great boxer. I thought a terrible rapper. In fact, <laughs> he had a partner named Kaysan who I signed. And uh, my intern, Curtis, um, worked for about, I guess, for like almost over a year at, with us. And he became 50 Cent. Wow. I signed Kaysan. So it just shows you where for our a listeners, our skills lay. Yeah. We're all about trying to build self confidence. And a lot of people find us because they're struggling with confidence in the social realm. Obviously with your background, where did you get the confidence to just waltz in with a record and wow these execs? Was there someone you picked up this confidence from, role modeled yourself after? You know, it's a big ass to go from, you know, a kid in Long Island into these boardrooms to make these asks, to make these requests. Yeah. Was there something that inspired all this confidence to you at a young age? You know, I don't think there's one thing that happened. I think people are born with different levels of, I don't want to even call it courage, but socialization or, or whatever. Some are extroverted, some are introverts, right. and all four of my kids are very different. Some are outgoing, some aren't. I just remember growing up that my mother, there were no nannies, there were no babysitters. My mother, I was the youngest of four, took me everywhere she went. <clears throat> so if my mother had a, a board of education meeting for two hours, I would sit in the corner and figure out how to entertain myself. <laughs> and I would have to dream. And I'd have to play and be alone and deal with it. As opposed to, I look at my kids now, they have a much different existence <laughs> yeah, than that. Right. You know, they're entertained constantly. and. Um, so I was a dreamer, you know, and, and my mom encouraged me to be in the school play and do different things and try different things. And she just put me in a position where I, I had no choice other than to socialize and, be, and get to be have a level of comfort in these scenarios. So I really thank her for that gift. Right. But it's been a struggle. You know, there are times where I feel very uncomfortable and times where I've had a, you know, I've been in meetings where I felt like I didn't belong in the meeting. Yeah. I've been, you know, just like all of us. And the way that I deal with it now is, and this is probably a technique that you guys don't teach and I probably wouldn't even necessarily recommend it, but it works for me. I'm very aware of my own mortality mm -hmm. and everybody's. And I say to myself, there's nobody here that's gonna be around in 100 years. Yeah. Everybody, look around the street, Jesse. This is my own internal pep talk. Like, we're all gone. I'm turning 50. Yeah. I probably won't be here in 50 years. Do I fucking care if I bomb this speech or if I don't do well or if someone doesn't like this podcast? I mean, that's kind of my mentality to kind of get me a, give me a little nudge, right? To go for it, and and for me it works. But you know, I've tried a lot of different techniques until I found something that like clicked in my head that said go for it. You know. Well, the one thing that I've noticed from both books now and also your coaching program is is your ability to quantify and then work out the math so that you do maximize those opportunities. So one of the things that really struck me was this idea of as you're turning 50, right, looking at the average lifespan and saying, you know what, I only have 20 plus summers left. I got to get myself into gear. And now approaching 50, I believe you're bringing in 50 experts to learn 50 skills for yeah. your 50th birthday. Yes. 
So this quantification, how did you stumble across this? How did this idea of, okay, I got to count my steps to equal miles. I got to count my years to equal this amount of time. I've been living my entire life forward. You know, like, what are we going to do this summer? Asking my wife, what are we doing for Christmas? What am I doing next year? What, you know, it's all been forward. And I just kind of took a step back and said, like, you know what? Let me reverse engineer the rest of my life. You know, like, my 70s, it, the average American lives to be 78. I, you know, I read that multiple times. Right. And that, that stat changes over time if you get older, mm -hmm. the, all this other, but in general, that's right. a pretty safe thing. I'm turning 50, so if I'm average, that means I have 28 years left. I just was on Mount Washington doing a hike in the winter. I didn't see any 60 year olds on the hill. Yeah. It made me realize that, like, you know, the things that I love to do that make me tick, that make me feel most alive, right. that window to accomplish the long list of things that I want to do in my life, it's shrinking every day. And if I reverse engineer out, you know, the next 30 years till when I'm 80, and again, how many, I don't see a lot of 80s in marathons, I don't see 80s jumping in frozen lakes or water skiing or doing the stuff that I enjoy. Right. Um, if, I'm, if I reverse engineer those years, well, 70 and 80 looks a lot different. That means I have 20 really active years if I'm knock on wood and healthy and injury free. And then like your whole relationship with time changes when you look at it through that reverse lens. Because right. then it's like, well, holy cow, who do I want to spend that time with and what is it that I want to do? Like your enemy becomes the clock. Yeah. And when that happens, you get a tremendous amount of urgency. You know what I mean? And urgency and everything. Like I said to my wife, I want to run this this race called Bad Water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of ultra marathons. And she said, um, well, think about that. That You can't do that because when you're in your 70s, your hips and your knees, I'm like, you think I'm worried about 70? <laughs> like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plan for when I'm 70 so I don't do what I want to do now? Right. No chance. And that's sort of how I've kind of looked at it. And it's just, you know, made me live my life a lot differently. And with that idea, how much of this are you focused now? You have four children passing these lessons on to them at such a young age, or are you kind of waiting for them to figure things out before you start passing down some of your mantras and, and views, especially that quantification one? My brother, uh, my brother just called me up and asked me how my eight year old, my oldest is doing in swim season this year in Atlanta. Yeah. And I said to him, you know, he's a decent swimmer. I said, but you know, he's uh, he really just doesn't have that fire to compete. You know, yeah. it's frustrating as a dad. And my brother said to me, well, as long as he's happy, you just want him to be happy. And I said to my brother, my son could sit on a couch and eat pints of ice cream and play Minecraft and be very happy. That's not what I want. <laughs> right. I want him to maximize his potential and have experiences. Right. And so it's it's a big part of how I parent, and I try to make sure that they have you know multi, that they're exposed to as many experiences as they can with me and on their own. So you know, and that, that doesn't mean like we're gonna go travel the world and you know ride camels and through the desert. Right. It just means that they're they're doing and they're creating opportunities in their own world. Is there anything that you can speak to that? <clears throat> um, uh, about that and what you tell your son like for instance like with Sarah it was very common in her household to talk about what had she failed at today what did she try it was like a very common thing that's what they discussed and and for yourself uh, with how you're raised of being able to try everything failure was just a, a was not it, it wasn't a word it was something that you tried it was something to get better at so is there any mantras that you've uh, laid out for a, an eight-year-old child to to get the wheels turning a bit that yeah. it's okay for you not to be good at this it's okay for you to learn this yes yeah, so for starters both sarah and i you know we praise the effort yeah not the result it's just we're all constantly praising the effort over and over and really that's a big theme and you know we when we set goals which we do often as a family as mm -hmm. a husband and wife yeah we make sure that our kids have goals so this summer each of our children has a goal you know that they've we've talked about right on. gonna work towards it and i'm talking about they're four years old and um but more importantly they experience i try to expose them to everything that i do so they can see the hard work that goes into and i fail at a lot of stuff of course but i want to see it 
Right. You know, I just took him to a basketball tournament that I played in for four days at Duke University. Okay. I lost yeah. in the semis, and my every time we won, we we did win to get to the semis. My son said, "Did you get a trophy? Did you get a trophy?" <laughs> and I, at the end when we lost, I said, "I'm not getting a trophy." Yeah. Because we didn't win. You have to win to get a trophy. Right. And but he got to experience that and experience me and my teammates. You know, my teammates and myself just being sad that we lost. So just exposing them to that stuff and not exposing them to, you know, participation trophies all day long. Right. And with that, there is a, a fun story that John was sharing with us earlier about a polar bear challenge where your son, I believe, was ready to do it, ready to do it. And then you went full blast. And yeah, it's a great example. He was still on the beach. <laughs> yeah. We, we went to the, uh, um, the fire department, puts on a polar, cha- polar bear challenge at Lake Lanier in Georgia, where we live. It's freezing in Lake Lanier in February. And I was getting my son all excited because he was going to be the youngest. I'm like, there's no five year olds there. You know, you're going you're to you're go nuts when you jump into the lake. And I'm putting on Rocky in the car. And he's grabbing him, <laughs> shaking him, and we're yelling at each other, getting fired up. And they blew the whistle to jump in the water, and everybody sprinted into the water except the one person standing on the beach, my son, <laughs> crying. And so I came out, and I said, you know, and he, and he was disappointed. He felt like he let me down. I said, no, 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 I'm so glad you got a chance to watch me go in the water. Yeah. And, you know, but he had to live with that for a year that you know failure of not being able to go in right and um the next year we went back same routine in the car rocky again and they blew the whistle and he was the first one in they blew the whistle right. to get uh-huh. out and he wouldn't get out you know <laughs> but, it, but it but it changed him right you know it changed him and my four-year-old just went through it yesterday we had a swim meet in uh atlanta i took the red eyes so i look so tired and um my four, I was getting them fired up, and we got to the starting line, and they blew the, the start. And all six racers got up on the block and dove into the water, except my son, who stayed on the block crying. And my wife was all upset. I'm like, this is an amazing learn- yeah. opportunity. Like, this is right. there's nothing to be upset about. He's four, you know, and like this is great. He's gonna have to understand it and get over it, and you know, we're gonna co- coach him into the next one. And it, it, it was a great moment. I was. I wish he jumped in, right. but I was just as happy that you know he tried and he was out there, and now he's going to get another shot, and he's going to feel what it feels like to stay with something and actually jump in the water and get wet. He's going to have that feeling of overcoming fear at four. I, right. That's amazing, you know. So it's 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 a blessing. Uh, so, something else that I really enjoyed about your book, and it's something I see in confident people and successful people that and I it's about embracing all the worst parts of you and you and you put it together and titled it Billy right yeah. Billy the bully that your internal bully uh, can you speak to a bit about that as is, is it is something that you've always noticed in yourself of talking yourself through these things and to that that made up person yeah, no, I think for all of us, I don't think there's anyone listening that I would say is an exception to this, that probably our biggest enemy is our own voice in Absolute, our head. Absolutely, yeah. And I call that Billy, the bully that lives in all of us, because it's graphic, it's easy to remember, mm-hmm. but, um, and that's just our own self-doubt, you know, that, our, that we can't, putting limits on ourselves and what we think we can do. Right. And once we get past that limiting self-talk, that's where really all the greatness is. And I'll give you the most obvious example in my life. You know, when I started running, I could run two miles. My goal was to run two miles. And that's what I wrote down on a piece of paper. Yeah. And I worked towards that goal. And I could like, do that in 18 minutes. I'm a runner. And um, fast forward a couple of years later, I ended up running 100 miles nonstop. And nothing changed in my body. It's not like I got stronger. My legs didn't change. Yeah. My lungs are the same ones God gave me. But that, that, that the belief that I could do it, the actual belief that I literally could run 100 miles nonstop is what got me there, along with training. But if I was stuck in the world of, okay, two miles was enough, I would have never realized that I was capable of 50 times what I thought I was. So now I ask myself all the time, what other areas of my life am I under-indexing in? If I was if I was 50x 
greater than I thought I was initially. Yeah. Could my net worth be 50x? Could my relationship with my wife be 50x? Could my health be 50x better? Like, where am I? You know, like, and the only way you know that is stepping into the unknown. You know what I mean? And um, to me, all the growth in my life, any success, anything has come from stepping into the unknown. Not necessarily pain, not going, it's going into areas that could be like, okay, record deal. I'm going into the office. I have no idea what's going to happen. I, they think I'm Dana Dane. I'm going into, you know, uh, I could just every example in my life has been like that. There was, a, <clears throat> I, th I think a lot of people when they have those bad feelings or they hear that voice, the easiest for them to do is to shut it away or push it away and not have to deal with it. By embracing that that person and and talking to them, you can work your way through it. And obviously with being Dana Dane or getting your way into somebody's boardrooms, that's so much different. Well, it's its a bit different than the, the physical challenges that you have to push your way through. And obviously, <laughs> a meeting up with David Goggins, pushing you in, uh, through that is definitely uh, a, a story in itself, which yeah. it is in the book. Um, was there any physical challenge before that that allowed you to know that you could push through those things much like having a hurdle in front of that boardroom that allowed you to find your way into it? Um, Do you remember like the first physical challenges that were I'll laid out for you? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I've always been a competitor in, in the sense of like wanting to, you know, uh, liking the challenge, no different than getting into the US Open, even physically, I've always kind of wanted to be better, I guess, on some level. The first real challenge was the New York Marathon I did when I was 22 okay. or something. And um, again, I had no, the most I had ran was 12 miles and now I had to run 26.2 miles. And, um, but I just knew that I was gonna finish it no matter what. So the bully, it didn't really exist because, you know, I said to myself, just, I was looking at other people that were finishing and I'm like, they don't look like they're in better shape than me. Yeah. You know, I, I created this whole, I beat him up. The bully got beaten up that way. Okay. Um, but I, you know, I'm in that situation a lot, you know, and I have to really have a conversation with myself. But the, the good news is for anybody, the more you face challenge and the more you go into the unknown, right. the quieter the bully gets, you know, the bully only exists when you let him exist. But the more th experiences you do, I talk about this all the time, the more edge you get. Now, I went and lived on a monastery. My takeaways weren't like, oh, you should be meditating every yeah. day. And like everybody knows that that's going to have a positive benefit. My takeaway was like, this is a new experience right. that I had no idea what to expect. And it built what I call my life resume got built up. And my experience meter got higher. And I got to, you know, um, it's just something that now has given me another layer of of experience. And they always say the more you experience, the more you can offer, the more you have to offer. Right. And I just feel like the more of these experiences that you put on your plate, the more interesting you become, the more you can offer the world or your kids or yourself, and the quieter the bully gets. Well, I think that's what's so remarkable and refreshing about you, having accomplished all of these things. It's easy to just blast out victorious mantras and I, I overcame this and I'm so great, but to be vulnerable enough to say, listen, I do have this bully. Everyone has it. I'm still battling it. Even though I've completed a hundred miles, even though I've got this record deal, I've created companies. So with that idea, again, going back to your kids, right? A lot of our listeners are parents or thinking about becoming parents. How have you instilled that belief of conquering their doubt and their bullies in those moments where they're on the sidelines crying and their bully got the best of them. Oh my gosh, it's so hard because one of my kids has anxiety. So like that's yeah. a whole nother extreme level of bully. You know, it's like Absolutely. and it's irra completely irrational. Um, you know, I've just various coping mechanisms, giving them a mark, giving them my, uh, uh, my necklace or something that makes them feel like it is magical. I mean, they're kids. So. Right. Uh, magical powers or a magic marble or something or empowering them. My son is now eight. I got him a phone where he can now call me if he needs to. It's a it's a one way calling system. He can only call okay. my wife or I. Um, but those that those things have really helped. But really just talking to him and and 
you know, before my kids go to bed every night, we say three things that they're that they're excited for and happy about. So we put real, you know, think about that. If you do that every day yeah, that's great. for a year, they're getting a thousand positive thoughts in their head. Yeah. Everything is cumulative. So it's not like, oh, it's just, it's not three thoughts a night. It's a thousand positive things that they're going to bed with over the course of a year. And to end the day on that. Right. right? Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about it's easy to beat yourself up. Sometimes it can be hard to find the positives, the things you are excited about or looking forward to. That's when right. Bully is, when Billy, your bully, is winning. So to bookend your day, to make sure that you're finding ways to be grateful in the morning and to end the evening on that, you don't allow that carryover through the night where you have, you're waking up and Billy's right there in the room ready to bully you again. It allows yeah. you to sort of clamp down and focus on the things that matter, the positives. But I'll tell you guys, you know, here I'm 50 years, I'm turning 50 this year in a month, 50 years old. Um, I've had, like I said, I've had plenty of egg on my face. I've fortunately had plenty of success as well. But I still struggle with it. I put this book out and there were multiple times, multiple times, up until a week before the book, I had to hand the book in, where I said to myself, I'm just going to return the money. Any money the publisher has, I'm just going to pay it all back any expenses that for any whatever and just move on because why do I need this what if people hate it it's not as good as a seal book in my own head is it as funny is it you know what if it gets bad reviews and what if, I had all the what ifs right. you know and I was like I don't fuck it let me just go take the easy way write him a check give him go home right um, and then I had to have my own conversation with my bully like no Get back in your chair and keep working on it until it's at a place that you're comfortable with. And why are you gonna give? You can't give up on this. And people are counting on you. And da da da, da and all the other thoughts. And now all I'm right. gonna have my own. I'm like in a fist fight with myself. Yeah. Um. But so it still happens. It doesn't go away. It's still a work in progress. Well, I want to dig into this because, you know, your story to most of us sounds larger than life and sounds like you've had all these amazing opportunities because you've been blessed. And you talk a lot about how you don't have the professional resume. You're working on this life resume. So for our listeners who are trying to land that job or trying to get their career off the ground, what do you tell them for building their life resume if they don't have the ability to scale a mountain you know, the next weekend with their friends or they don't have the ability to compete in a 100-mile race? Well, I don't think that you need to have events like that. I just think that – I think that by building your life resume – and we can talk about how you can do that without having a lot of money or a lot yeah. of time or anything. But I think that that can help you land your dream job. I think it can help you uh, you know, scale up quicker in your office setting and get it – you know, maybe land the position, a higher position because – it makes you a lightning rod. It makes you more interesting. If I said, you know what, I went this, I volunteered. Let's take something that's free. Right. I volunteered for uh, and built a home for a home through what's it called? Habitat, Habitat for yeah, Humanity. Habitat for Humanity. And I built a home in Mexico for this family and I went and it was unbelievable. I want to know about that. Tell me right. about that. I want to talk to that person. Or I, this week I, I slept outside for the homeless as the McDon for the Ronald McDonald fund and it was unbelievable and I met all that and one CEO was that I want to talk to that person those things are, that's a lot more interesting than oh I went to you know I went to Honolulu and I sat on on the you know in the lounge chair and read the newspaper I had an amazing vacation we swam in the ocean right like, who gives a fuck I, that to me is what I'm talking about like you can take these moments and think about this I have a friend uh, my friend Kevin and every year Kevin who's a police officer on I'm sure uh, a a re very reasonable salary right. in Suffolk County. Every every year, Kevin takes a trip with since he's 21 with his high school friends. They go away. Every once every two every two months, Kevin circles something on his calendar with his family and they go on a trip. It could be in a camper. It can be uh, to run a race. It could be to go to a fishing. Whatever. So in the next 30 years, Kevin will have created 150 lifetime memories through these little stint, stunts, with stints, whatever right. you want to call them, right? And um, I call it the Kevin rule just by every – and I said if I can't take a weekend every eight weeks to mark my calendar and build my resume with 150 amazing, memorable moments. And the younger you start, you start at 35, 
Then you have 225 moments. You know, um, that's how you do it. And it doesn't cost anything right. necessarily, you know. Um, but it makes you really interesting, really well-rounded. It beats up the bully. It makes you charming and more, you know, approachable. And um, I just think it's so important. And if you don't, you end up in routine. And then right. you wake up and you're 60. And you're like, I blew all those weekends. I can't believe, I, you know, my knee hurts. I can't do that now. Right. And all of a sudden you have, like, you have regret. That's exactly what we're trying to avoid in our life, you know? And you have such a refreshing take on networking. Obviously, we're big on building relationships and connecting with people here at The Art of Charm. And we completely agree that experiences are what form those bonds. And you, you end the book with this exact concept of, listen, networking, business cards, that's all bullshit. Give me experiences over running a room and trying to collect business cards any day of the week. And you look at your life with all of these friends. I mean, you have your lifelong friends here in the room, and it all is tied to these experiences together, going up the mountain together, going on this race together, volunteering together. And I think a lot of times we get this feeling like, oh, I got to collect friends or I got to collect business cards or I got to be doing something to be moving ahead. And it's just so refreshing to hear, book the trip, book the event, get people together to experience something together. And then you don't have to worry about the network maintenance or the transactional thing. You can phone up your friend that you went up Mount Washington with in two years and instantly be connected based without on that question. experience. For life, without question. But even what we're doing right now, I was running late. It created this thing where I feel guilty. I feel like I owe something. I'm just talking about this is human nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there is a now there is a connection, right? We're sitting together. I can physically see you guys. You guys see me. Yeah. That is um I probably will never forget it. You know, I might, but I don't think so. <laughs> and, Let's hope you know, not. <laughs> no, we were, right, no, you guys are super memorable. Um you know, John and I went on a little cross bus to gain like it just you can't take it away. Right. You just can't take it away. The business card goes away, it never happened. The experience can't be erased. It's just it happened. Right. And again, I, I, I love going back to the kids and and we are gonna delve a little bit more into your marriage too, because Sarah Blakely is, is fascinating in her own right. But you talk about training kids to run marathons and how you think everyone should run a marathon and take on such a physical challenge. Can you unpack that a little bit for our listeners as to why the marathon is, is like the, the gold standard for you <laughs> challenge wise? I've said that a long time ago, but I, I'm gonna stick to it. Um, I just think that you know it, it allows, I think that it requires certain things that translate into all life skills. It requires planning, training, execution, and maybe failure. And I think that all kids should have to go through you know that discipline process right. because it, it'll just regardless if they cross the finish line or not at the end of the race they will come out a different human for the better and when you to get real change the challenge has to be big enough right to affect change you know what i mean so like if i said we're all going to go in here and run a 5k Oh, that sucks, man. I'm not a runner, man. I don't know. But you'll, you would do it. It wouldn't be that big a deal. You'd be like, oh, right. that wasn't so bad. But if I said we're going to go run 50 miles, we're going to hold hands, and we're all, all going to finish the finish line, cross the finish line together no matter what, even if we all have to carry John. Uh, <laughs> sorry, John. Uh, we, would, we would come out changed humans. Right. You know what I mean? So the challenge has to have – has to be big enough. And I think for kids, that's a – for anybody – that's a, a really daunting, oh, I can't do it. And it, it, it immediately, for those that complete it, shatters what they think their perceived limitations are. Well, I like that with all those steps that you put in there, failure is still in there as well. And it's a very a real possibility. But it's not the end of the world. It's not a big deal. It's just what it is. Yeah, I mean, I, it's just I don't, like, I don't really judge things based on the outcome. You know, I've had plenty of businesses that I thought like were, I just, the outcome is kind of almost gravy. Think about this. A UFC fighter trains for six oh, yeah. months, right? They're yeah. eight hours a day. And then there's diet and video and training, you know, all this stuff, the mental meditation, forget about the gym. And, and then they could lose the fight in six seconds or they could win it 
yeah. in six seconds if they catch the right angle or whatever. It's like you can't, it's, it, it's, it's the preparation, it's the process. It's like the journey, man. It's like, you know, the, the win is the gravy. Well, it's I the think process. that's what's so great about the mantra that building a life resume, right? If, if your focus is gaining as many experience points and trying as many things as possible, then there certainly is not going to be one singular failure that sticks out to you or one singular victory that sticks out to you. It allows you the opportunity to really enjoy the process. And I know for us in building the business over the last 11 years, it is a process and it's a journey that never feels done, right? You're, you're on to the next level. You're on to figuring out YouTube now and figuring out how you can leverage this. So it allows you to prime yourself for that idea of life is a journey. I better get used to it. I better enjoy the process because at the end when it's over, that's the only thing I'm gonna have to look back on. Not the outcome, not the finish, but where I was through that journey. Right. And well, totally agree. to go with that, anytime that we've been in trouble in the past and we've talked to anyone who who we thought had the answers and much like with when you went to see the, the girl's father for the record deal about yeah. the the, for the for the games, he was going to give you ten grand. Right. To people that we thought had the answers, and they're like, "Oh, where you where you guys are? That's nothing. You'll be laughing about that in a few years." Well, when you're in it, it yeah. feels it's, off. It, it feels, feels insurmountable. It, 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 yeah. It but to 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 their credit, yes, every time that we have looked back to those moments, they are hilarious, and it's what made this journey so spectacular and so fun. It's you know, I I feel like I'm part of your journey. Because it's, I feel the same exact way. Absolutely. You know, I look back and things that were insurmountable, and you laugh at them now, and you're like, oh my, you know. And because you've gotten past them, and you've realized that you can overcome, and you've gotten better and wiser, and yeah. you can, the ability to endure is greater, and all that stuff. Yeah. Well, it's it's funny how we've kind of taste how we've taken this twisted path, right? Your first podcast ever was the Art of Charm podcast it was. with Jordan. Yes, and now our first interview ever is with you. It's unbelievable. So our journeys are intertwined, and we really appreciate the opportunity because we agree with so many of your mantras. and And this book is chock fantastic. full of them. And as Johnny and I were reading it, every time we went to a bolded section, I'm like, Yeah, I remember saying that exact thing to you. So these these mantras that you live by, and it seems like you've been collecting over ages at this point is there any one that really stands out as your go-to mantra for anyone who's looking to become the next jesse isler uh, oh i don't know um i think uh one that really really moves the needle with me that i i rely on often are two words uh that really impact my life and i i refer back to them whenever i have a big decision and whenever i have to make a split second decision and those two words are remember tomorrow. And when I have to make that decision, I think about how will I feel tomorrow based on the decision I make today. So if I want to drop out of the marathon at mile 20, I can do that now. But remember how I'm going to feel about that tomorrow when someone says, how'd you do? Did you finish? Do I want to you know, get drunk at the holiday party and you know, dance on the table? That's amazing that night. Oh, Jess, look at him. He's on the loop. Until tomorrow you walk in the right. office and you feel like a jackass. Um, that 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 saved me. It saved me a bunch of times. So those two words are very powerful. And um, so I think that's probably one of the, the one that – because I can use it every day. Right. I use it with my book all the time. No. No. Get back up there. You're going to – You'll be so mad tomorrow. You'll be, and you'll be, and the reverse works too. Think about how proud you'll be tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You right. know, that you, they, yeah. You know, so that that's been a big one. Yeah. So this month, and what this episode is going to fall into, is going to be our first, uh, our first impressions. And there was one that I wanted to ask you about because you always get vibes from people, and there's a there's a first impression that you get where you're like, I want to hang out with that guy i want to meet that person i want to do that and i had watched i had discovered david goggins when he went on rogan and i was blown away by his story and i was laughing so hard about you with the full kabang with everybody there the masseuses and the food and here comes this guy with a with a folding chair 
a box of crackers and a bottle of water and he's shitting blood and he's just beat up and he just refuses to stop. I just I just have to hear just your thoughts on seeing David and what was going through your mind and so as a first impression or just yeah. in general um, just your what you were getting from him well before your, the so spiked your curiosity I was doing a race uh, a 24 hour race with a bunch of teammates he had no teammates he yeah. was doing the whole race himself <laughs> and um before the race even started I re- I I identified this guy as someone I was going to follow uh, during the race and ultimately beyond because he was just massive. He was just big. and He like, was big at the time. He just stood out and he had this different energy about him, you know? So uh, immediately I was drawn to him and uh, ultimately that led me to pursuing, you know, a relationship with him, you know? Um, but... But he, he, you know, he gave off a strong first impression at that race. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have the the good opportunity of, of meeting him and interviewing him in September. So we're looking. We'll hear his to first impression of you as well. <laughs> okay, yeah, cool. I'm Very sure cool. he's, he's got some things to say. I think a, another great story around first impressions, and this is you making an impression on Sarah, your your wife. What was the backstory between you two coming together? Well, she was a customer uh, of Marquee Jet, a company that I, I co-founded, and we were having a customer appreciation poker tournament in Vegas. And um, it was, of the 4,000 customers we had, we could only invite, I think we had 40 slots because NetJets, our partner, had the rest. Gotcha. So each rep could invite one. It was, high, it was very, very difficult to get an, an invitation because it was like one in 100. So our Georgia rep sent in a picture of Sarah to me and said, I think this would be a good fit and I wrote her back please don't invite anyone else you know like make sure she comes kind of thing because um, it was like a, it was just a picture of Sarah who I didn't know I didn't even know the name the company or anything and she had an apple on her head it was just really weird I was like this just she seems really interesting um, and we met at the poker tournament and we were in Vegas and it was 9.30 we went out to dinner and she excused herself because she was it was her bedtime and she was going to go to bed and I'm like who goes to bed at 9.30 in Vegas? Like, yeah. this is a really interesting human. And uh, I married that interesting human. <laughs> we also talk about how it's easy to get your first impression wrong of someone. We That's like to true. think that when we meet someone, we can see everything we need to see and, and we trust our gut and that snap judgment. And a big character in the book is Lenny. Yeah, And yes. your first impression mm-hmm. of Lenny Completely wrong. Completely (laughs) off the mark. Yeah. So explain that without giving away too much of the book because – Well, let me start by saying that it's one of the reasons why I went to the monastery because I lost my gut instinct. I I think maybe if I had a clean – if I was spending – if I wasn't so distracted, I think maybe my my instincts would have picked up a different vibe. I honestly feel that. Um, How did did you lose your gut? Can you – I just wasn't – I was just – you know, I was – your instincts are like a muscle. They have to be exercised. The only way they can really exercise your intuition is by spending time alone. Otherwise, you're influenced by your mm, friends, yes, the yeah. radio, TV, and like you're just being influenced. If you're alone, there is no influence. And that's how you exercise your intuition. But I have four kids and the internet and Netflix and a wife and <laughs> everything else, and right. I wasn't being alone. And... um so that's that. But so when I got to the monastery, there was an intern there named Lenny. And, um, you know, Lenny made the hair on my ar- arm stand. I mean, he freaked me out when I first met him to the point that I was I was locking my door literally at night. I had a chair that I, I put, this is 100% true, underneath my door. And I had a hanger from the, um, I like rigged my whole room. So like the door <laughs> be trapped. Open. The door could, like, you didn't have to be like a bull to open the door. Uh, but... As it turns out, I was wrong. Uh, you know, I was wrong about Lenny. He, you know, he wasn't what I thought he was, or at, at least I think he wasn't. And with that whole idea of throwing yourself into the monastery after coming out of the seal situation, you even talk about it in, in the book how crazy Sarah thought you were for this whole idea and how spontaneous you are, not even doing the research. And then I, I well save the surprise for the readers, but. 
a lot of us have this image of monastery in our mind as one thing. So you were already coming in thinking it was one thing and you got quite the surprise when it was not that. How do you throw yourself in the unknown and allow yourself to adapt? Because I feel like a lot of us are so stuck in our routines and, and our comfort zone. And this adaptability is something that I, I find really remarkable about you. It seems like any situation, whether you're in a Starbucks just outside of the event, you can't get in. All right, I'm buying some donuts and I'm going to start hawking these to get huh. some face time. I think it comes from a, first from gratitude, you know, like having opportunity. I love opportunity. I love newness. Uh, I think it comes from just being having just an open, just being open minded and not having, you know, if you have a movie in your head of what you think it's going to be, very often if it's not, you're going you're to be disappointed. Yeah. And um, so very often I that I leave that movie blank in my head, so I can just sometimes it's good just to experience. Other times I don't. Other times I just have a whole misconception or I could be disappointed about something. But a lot of times I'm just like, I'm just going to let it be and, you know, a little free spirit with it. Um, the monastery, I didn't want to have, I didn't want to do a lot of research because then I would have, it would have, I would have had it already like kind of the whole script already written. Right. You know, and I just would have been going through a script that I already knew. I wanted to go and, you know, like watch the movie for the first time. So I didn't go on the internet at all. I didn't research it at all. I didn't. I just didn't want to know. From some of the anecdotes in the book, it seems that you do that quite frequently. <laughs> um, I do. I do. I mean, <laughs> it just makes it more exciting. Well, even the the process of writing this book, right? In the book, you talk about your doubt around completing the project, Without coming question. out the other side, and saying, "There's no book here. I'm not even sure we have something here." Without question. But there are parts of my life where. You know, I don't listen. I don't go into meetings unprepared. I don't go walk onto stage to give a speech unprepared. I don't, uh, you know, I'm, I make sure I read the report card before I have the parent teacher conference. And <laughs> I, I'm not reckless, but uh, in certain adventures, I find a benefit in just in just experiencing, you know. But I'm not going to go climb Mount Washington without researching that what to wear and what to do and how to survive in the cold and all that stuff. So. It plays both ways, right? But um, I just think it, it leads it leads for a, a much more exciting life when you actually can experience instead of you know having everything explained. We live in a world where you can get everything. You can Google images and see where you're going and get all these things. But sometimes it's good just to show up, right? Without the preconceived notions yeah. that can lead you to have a crappy experience or not as full of an experience as you'd like. Yeah. Oh, wow. I thought the rooms were going to be so much bigger from the pictures or I thought the water looked like the ocean looked like it was so much blue. You know, let me just go in the ocean. Like, the, <laughs> let me just go in the ocean and then enjoy the ocean. Not be disappointed because it's not as blue as the picture. The other part that I, I really thought was interesting as a dog lover myself is here you're at this monastery and you're not a dog person, you admit, and you come to find out that dog training also goes on at the monastery and <laughs> you're gonna play a role in this. So uh, were there any points, uh, you talk a little bit about it in the book, were there any points where you were like, I, I just can't do this anymore, I I'm ready for Sarah, I'm ready to get back home and screw yeah. these dogs and screw these monks? Yeah, not, not so much because of the dogs, but more just because of the isolation Yeah, um, that I thought that like really, I was like, five days is enough. <laughs> Who's gonna really care if I went five days or fifteen days? Like, would you guys care? Like, oh, is it for five days? You'd be like, okay, or it's no, there's no difference. And when I, before I left, my wife said, uh, make sure you stay until you either have a breakthrough or you're broken. <laughs> and um, so, I definitely felt like I wanted to cut it short. But again, remember tomorrow. I was like, I'm gonna stick this thing out. I don't want to have to regret the one opportunity in my in my life to be here and to experience and to go through it that I shortchanged myself. Right. No. What I love about your relationship with Sarah is that ability to allow both of you to be high performers, high achievers, go after what you want, but still have time for each other and for the family. And you talk a lot about your love of sports, but again, calculating the amount of hours you spend passively watching sports and yeah. realizing that I'm kind of wasting away here. This is time I need to focus on myself to grow. So yeah. 
how how did that start early in your relationship and then how have you managed that through your marriage because obviously running multiple companies and jet setting and doing everything that both of you do I know it's difficult for me in, in my relationship to balance that work life and my own personal pursuits yeah. well once you get once you bring marriage into the equation you you're 50 percent of your time maybe more maybe less I don't know but a significant amount of time gets taken away not taken away it just gets redirected right because now you have dinners, friend, di two sets of friends. My friends, Sarah, Sarah's friends. You have when I want to eat, when she wants to eat, stuff she wants to do together, stuff I have to do out of obligation to her work. So you lose a lot of time. So you have to be way more efficient. You 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 take a look at well, what has to what has to go. Something has to give. Right. And when I looked at my life, I realized like, whoa, I'm watching. I don't think Sarah's going to really want to watch the Florida State USC <laughs> game today, you know, or like right. the Hawaii Wyoming, you know, <laughs> battle on Saturday night. So um, when I looked at it, I took a real deep dive into it. And I realized, you know, if, at the pace that I'm on, watching football, I love watching football. If I continue this until I'm 80 something years old, I will have watched 36,000 hours of football which is several years worth of football of my life and i just took the plug out i cold turkeyed it basically and then it freed up time i i just reallocated a lot of that time to my marriage right and w were these conversations that you had pre-marriage too around you know what your pursuits were and and what were non-negotiables for you versus what she needed for herself no nope we um I got married later in life at 40. Sarah was 37. And um, so I had a, a lot of the adventure of my, you know, I, I kind of had a lot of adventure, but we didn't really talk about it. You know, there were a couple of things that we talked about that were like kind of um, important to me and important to her, mm -hmm. but yeah. So it's been adapting and adjusting mm -hmm. through marriage and, and now having so many children. And it's constant. Yeah. We're constantly changing. I mean, we just started meeting once, trying to meet once a week just to go over like family stuff. Like we realized that like, how are we not meeting to go over like our own? <laughs> right, with all the other meetings like, yeah, we like, have. We have a million meetings and we're not even meeting. And we go to dinner and we go to, we do stuff, but like we're not sitting down and, and checking in on like summer plans and this and that and what we want to do and how we want to parent and what's going on here and what's working and what's not working. So we reevaluate, you know, now and get together, which is I like it. Yeah. Oh, I had one other question because we're just the first impressions. And I think it's a okay. great anecdote. Uh, you talk a lot about preparation and, and being prepared before you get to the meeting, whether it's a marathon. And there's a story from a presentation at Goldman Sachs where you actually made a poor first impression and some people left the room because you weren't dressed in the proper attire. Yeah. Was that on purpose going into Goldman Sachs knowing, you know what, I don't want to be a stiff suit. I don't want to be seen as everyone else. I want to be me. Or how much thought did you put into that first impression knowing that it may turn off some of the people in the room? You know, I didn't think, I didn't really give it much thought. I've been, I give speeches. Uh, this is, I wear stuff that's comfortable for me. It wasn't offensive. I wasn't in right. a Hawaiian outfit, like, you know, party. <laughs> I was in, you know, maybe a pair of dark jeans and a shirt. But everybody else was in suits. Right. And someone came over to me afterwards and said, you know, oh, my God, I'm so glad I stayed. Uh, I got so much out of the speech. He was like, because my department left because you weren't wearing a suit. I was like, what? They left? Because I was, first of all, I didn't even get a memo about a dress code. Right. Um, but, you know, I understand it. And I didn't mean to offend anyone in that. But... At the same time, like I would have said no to the speech if I had to give wear a suit because that would be like that's not me. I mean, I, maybe not. No, I think I would have said no. Right. It's just I want to be comfortable delivering my message the way I live my life in a suit. It's just it's a good, nothing against suits, but I right. don't wear yeah. suits. Right. So I've worn them, but I don't wear them now, and I'm not going to give a speech in one. You know, just because you guys want me to fit into the thing. It's just like, and I'm talking about adventure and life resume and it just doesn't fit for me. Right. Plus, where do you get a suit these days? <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't even know. <laughs> well, <clears throat> with all the uh, re experience resume and the challenges that you've been on uh, in, in putting this book together at the end, 
Uh, well, you've talked about your 50th birthday and the 50th, the 50 challenges that you're going to put ahead of you. But also there is a on your website for people to put in the challenges they want to overcome this year. Could you speak a bit to that? Yeah, I just uh, I'm just, you know, this is a big part of my life, putting on challenges and, and for myself. So I just said to anyone that they went to jessegetzler.com slash life resume, they could fill out what it is the challenge they want to do. And it could be big or small. It could be mm-hmm. p- take piano lessons. It could be learn how to be a comedian, whatever. And every month I pick somebody and fund that uh, journey for them. So it's been fun. And several people, you know, it's interesting to see what's, what's what the people have, are, are posting. But I just think it's like, you know, we've spoken about this a lot today, but – I just think it's so important, you know, for you as an indivi- for individuals to, again, step into that unknown. And it could be a small thing like I'm going to learn how to play an instrument or it could be a big thing like I'm going to climb Everest. Out of the 50 challenges to rap, is there one that stands out to you as the most daunting, the one that you're maybe a little nervous of out of learning all those 50 skills? Yeah, I mean, we didn't get into it. So for my 50th birthday, I'm bringing in 50 50- different instructors one a week to teach me things I always wanted to send my master right um, you know free diving wake surfing how to play chess I don't know how to ride drive stick shift um, I don't know how to ride a motorcycle so those kind of things um, I, I'm excited to have a, uh, a survivalist come and just teach me how to like you know light a fire with sticks and do all kinds I just always wanted to learn how to like stay dry in the rain in the wilderness and do all this stuff. So that's something I'm just excited about for me. A lot of firsts. Yeah. yeah. First for you guys. It's a, a redo for me. Is there anything that you want to close with to, to pitch? I know you have the summit coming up. Is there anything else you're trying to... just want to thank you guys for, uh, you know, this is the first podcast I ever did was Art of Charm. And I didn't know what in the world I was doing. <laughs> And I still don't, <laughs> but you guys still stuck with me and gave me a second shot. So uh, I, I appreciate it, and um, I'm just really happy to uh, to be here. So appreciate you guys, man. And we appreciate it. Love the book. Love Absolutely. living with the seal as well. Thank so check you. out both, and we're excited for the next one. Have you picked who you're living with next? Uh, probably live with Sam. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank Thank you you guys.